A lonely roar echoes across Zambia's Lua Plain. There is no answer. There hasn't been for years. Poaching has wiped out her kind. For five years, she has had to survive alone. But this year, her world could change. Will she finally find a mate? Or will she remain the last lioness? There is a place in southwestern Zambia so remote that until recent years, only the most intrepid explorers ever reached it. It's called Lua Plain, a sprawling floodplain that stretches over three and a half thousand square kilometers. In the heart of this isolated wilderness lives one lonely lioness. She is known as Lady Lua, and she's in her prime. All her instincts drive her to find a mate, have cubs, and form a pride of her own. But she can't. She's alone here. There isn't another lion for hundreds of kilometers. It was humans that sealed her fate. For though few outsiders make it to Lua Plain, some of those that have changed it forever. This is a wounded land. In the late 1990s, poaching tore through its wildlife populations. As the Angolan War raged, Soldiers and villagers slaughtered Lua's herds for food, while a scourge of illegal trophy hunters stole its most majestic creatures. Animals once plentiful on the plain disappeared. Wild dog, buffalo, earlant, all gone. Prey shortage and trophy hunting drove the once thriving lion population to collapse. Today, the last of Lua's lions stare out of glass eyes as they decorate the homes of trophy hunters worldwide. Since 2003, this land has been protected by the African Parks Network. The poaching has all but ceased, and its wildlife populations have begun to recover. The wildebeest herds are slowly swelling to their former glory, and many species have been translocated back onto the plain. But of the lions, only one remains. Surprisingly, she's in peak condition. The scar next to her fly-bitten nose and a healed gash on her shoulder are the only clues to the battles she has faced. But surviving as a solitary lioness on these plains isn't easy. Her first concern is food. By the height of the rains in mid-December, scores of wildebeest roam the plain. In the dense grasslands, Lady is all but invisible.
Her tawny coat provides perfect camouflage, and an animal grazing in the tall grass wouldn't see her coming. But wildebeest prefer short grass. They keep to the open plain, where hopeful predators have nowhere to hide. Usually, lions hunt in teams that can surround prey and drive it into an ambush. Lady has no such advantage. She must stalk her prey alone, in plain sight. She must choose her target well. An animal on the outskirts of the herd that has let its vigilance slip. Wildebeest warn each other of danger, so she must approach unseen by the entire herd. Just one glance in her direction, one snort of alarm, will ruin the hunt. Just like that, the hunt is over. With the herd's vigilance peaked, it's not worth another try. Without the support of a pride, Lady Lua must succeed the first time or go hungry. In 2005, a South African cameraman named Herbert Brower came to Lua to film spotted hyenas. By that time, Lady Lua had been alone for at least two years. Back then she was a myth, literally a whisper about this mysterious line that roams the plains. She'd been rarely seen, and if then only at a distance. But on our first day of the first assignment, suddenly there she was, right in front of our eyes. Herbert is one of the very first outsiders to see her and confirm that she is alive and healthy. It's early November, the start of the wet season, and a fearsome storm approaches. Lady Lua will use it to her advantage. As Herbert watches, the hunt begins. The new calves make perfect targets. Lady Lua eats alone. She doesn't need a big kill. A calf will keep her going for almost a week.
It's an extraordinary long-distance sprint for a lioness. Over a hundred meters at full speed. I was amazed not only how fast, but also how far she ran. But that night I also came to realize that hunting is certainly not the only challenge she faces here on the plain. Lady Lua is the only lioness here, but she's not the only predator. Spotted hyenas are prolific in Lua, an ever-present threat once night has fallen. They approach from all sides, drawing Lady away from her kill. It's a cunning diversion. And an easy steal. Crucial seconds pass before she realizes that her kill is lost. Yet she doesn't fight back. Her small, half-eaten carcass is not worth a fight with half a dozen hyenas. Lady's survival hinges on avoiding conflict, as much as it does on making kills. In the months following the first sighting, Herbert keeps a constant vigil for Lady on his filming expeditions. At first, we only saw her at a distance. But after a few weeks, she became more comfortable with us. Sometimes she even seemed to be excited to see us and left whatever she was busy with and came towards us. I think we were the first animals in years that she approached that were not running away. And she slowly tested the waters to actually see how far she could trust us. One day, on Herbert's third assignment in Lua, Lady does something unexpected. She came towards our vehicle, and when she was really close, just a few meters away, she rolled over, almost as if she wanted to show that she trusted us. affectionate behavior becomes commonplace and rolling becomes her greeting. We knew she recognized us and that she somehow started bonding with us. Otherwise she would not come and do it so often.
Sometimes, Herbert finds Lady near their camp at night when the crew sets out to film. She allows them to follow close behind her as she roams the plane. On one such night, Lady leads the crew to a pan where a wildebeest cow is straining through a difficult birth. The calf seems stuck in the birth canal, and the cow can no longer stand. It's over in seconds, an almost merciful end for the struggling mother. This is a big kill for Lady. It will feed her for days. The cow is silenced quickly, but its bleating during the birth may have been heard. Lady tries to drag the heavy pregnant carcass into the cover of taller grass. But it's too late. She's been discovered. Elated with the easy kill, Lady toys with the carcass like a kitten oblivious to the threat that closes in around her. By the time she hears them, she is surrounded. Ominous calls lure her away from the kill once again. As she wades out to meet the challenge, the hyenas seize their opportunity. Coming in from all sides, the thieving horde makes off with the carcass and tears it apart in true hyena style. But Lady will not be defeated so easily. Unlike the calf, this kill is worth a fight. She may be alone, but she is still a large, fearsome lioness. It's 12 hyenas to one, but despite their numbers, the hyenas cower. She eats alone on the carcass. As a dozen hungry eyes watch and wait in the shadows. Over the years of filming, Herbert came to learn that Lady's relationship with the hyenas changes with the seasons. By August, the grasslands are tinder dry and the pans parched and cracked. All life strains against the drought. The wildebeest herds head for greener pastures up north leaving only a few tough bulls for prey. In these sparse times, every scrap counts. For many predators, scavenging becomes a necessary part of life. Lady will steal the hyena's kills as often as they steal hers. In the dry season, they are mortal enemies, and Lady fights for every carcass.
But when the rains come in November, everything changes. Weeks of unrelenting downpours drench the landscape. Lured by the lush new vegetation, the wildebeest herds flood back onto the plains in a migration second only to the Serengeti. Calves are born by the hundreds and prey abounds. Lady thrives in the wet season, killing so often that hunting becomes more a sport than a necessity. With so much prey, tensions between her and the hyenas diminish. Sometimes she'll calmly abandon a fresh kill, preferring to roll around Herbert's vehicle as her prize is pilfered. With so much to go around, it's hardly worth a fight. But by January, things change once again. The rains reach their climax, and the plain disappears underwater. Lua becomes largely inaccessible, and how Lady hunts in the flood is a mystery. Yet season after season, the lonely lioness overcomes the odds stacked against her. With each year of filming here on the plains, I understood her behavior better and better. And I realized she's not only surviving, she's thriving. That there was one thing, though, she could not overcome, and that was her loneliness, her isolation. But it took me three years to understand how lonely she really was. After a night of filming, Herbert and his crew return to camp. They are not alone. As Herbert walks through camp in the dark, he hears a movement in the trees. I heard something and then I looked and I saw, I saw something in the dark and it was her. But I was not afraid. I knew somehow that she was not there to do us any harm or that she did not come to hunt. That night, somehow, a bond was forged between us. Since then, she's come into camp every other night. Most wild lion prides avoid contact with people, but it seems that Lady Lua's isolation drives her to seek human company. We never fed her, and there was nothing for her to scavenge on. So there was no other reason for her to visit us other than for companionship. It is amazing to think that a completely wild animal that has been harassed and her pride been massacred by us trusts us and somehow makes that move. Just absolutely amazing.
Sometimes she would lie next to the tent. I would fall asleep and listen to her purr. And the next morning, I would wake up and she was still there. It was really amazing to experience this mutual trust with a completely wild predator that had only bad experience with human beings. She's obviously following me because she's looking for company. She's alone. As much as I care for Lady Lua, I know that I must keep my distance. She's a wild animal and we want to keep it that way. We cannot allow her to close the distance too much because that would invariably invite an accident. And that is the last thing we want to have. Herbert doesn't allow Lady to come closer than about five meters. But she keeps trying to get his attention. I knew something had to change when she started changing her behavior. She scratched the trees. She even destroyed the seat of the Land Cruiser. And I realized I could never be the mate she was looking for. She really needed a companion of her own kind. At last, in October of 2008, this may just be possible. Herbert is not the only one who's been following Lady Lua's plight. Craig Reed of African Parks manages Lua Plain National Park. And for the last two years, he's been hatching a plan to bring lions back to Lua. One of the primary objectives of African Parks managing national parks in Africa is to rehabilitate the natural processes which have always taken place in the parks. Lions have always been a very important part of the processes here. And for that reason, we felt it was very important to bring them back. I think Lady Lua has become a special character and it's going to be fantastic for her to relinquish that character status and just become a normal lion again. For me that's what's most important about this whole process. Before a male can be brought in, Lady Lua must be collared so that the African Parks team can find her if anything goes wrong during the translocation. Despite vet Ian Parsons' special care, sedation can be a traumatic experience for any wild animal. But will it be enough to shake her newfound faith in humans? The shot is perfect. The team must move quickly. This was the first time I touched her, and I must say she has got an incredible presence. But I keep wondering how she will react to the whole process. I really hope that she does not go back into hiding after all this. With Lady Collard, the 450-kilometer journey to Kafui to find an eligible male begins. After days of searching, they find a perfect target. Young, healthy, and looking for a pride of his own.
The team are elated, but getting the mail to Lua won't be easy. It's the dry season, and the long road back is riddled with pitfalls. Yeah, great. We've got the line. Uh, now it's eight hours, ten hours to Lua. Hopefully everything's going well on the pontoon. And then uh, new life, new pride. She won't be the last liners anymore. The roads are rough, the temperatures searing, and the lion must be sedated many times before finally reaching the enclosure in Lua. After 11 long hours, they arrive at last. There's nothing left to do but make the lion comfortable, leave him a good meal, and wait for him to wake up. But something goes wrong. The lion panics as he comes around and must be sedated again. But this time, he chokes on regurgitated food. He doesn't make it. All the team can do is cremate him, so that the sedatives in his system won't poison scavenging animals. This is very disappointing. This is my line who was going to be the beginning of a new pride for the lady. All gone. I don't even know whether she's accepted that collar. Now she will react to us humans, to me. Now, let's see. Let's see from here. Herbert returns to camp to continue filming, but a shadow hangs over him and the crew. He still doesn't know how Lady has reacted to the collaring, and whether their relationship has changed. She is waiting for him, as trusting as ever. Seeing her again, I know that we cannot give up on her. African Parks is already planning a second translocation, learning from the first failed attempt. This time, they wait almost eight months for the end of the rains, when much of the region remains underwater. On the 11th of May, 2009, the team returned to Kafui. As the sun sets, audio recordings of lionesses roar out over the valley, luring hopeful young male lions into the area with the irresistible promise of mates. I've got two lions coming towards us. OK, we heard them calling um, two males, confirm. This time, the team look for a coalition, two brothers who can support each other through the translocation process. but he's breathing beautifully, heart rate's normal. Okay, that's, yeah, that's no problem, we'll keep an eye out on this, huh? It's 
Turn them over. dawn, the journey to Lua begins. It's a five-hour truck ride to the flooded marshland that surrounds Lua Plain. And another hour by boat to Lua. Crossing the marshes halves the journey. The team need to move fast. Dr. Parsons wants to administer as little sedative to these lions as possible, and this dose will wear off by the hour. There's another advantage to the wet season. Lions have a strong homing instinct, but the high water should keep them locked in lure for long enough to settle into a new territory. Locals throng to see the new arrivals as the last leg of the journey begins. An hour-long race across Lua Plain to the enclosure. Time is everything. The males will start to come round soon. The team need to get them safely into the enclosure before they're awake enough to be dangerous. Before the lions are released, one male needs to be collared so that the coalition's movements can be followed and apprehended if they make a break for home. Every second is crucial now. The lions are so groggy that they can barely move, but the drug-induced stupor lifts by the minute. The team move quickly and quietly to cause as little stress to the reviving lions as possible. They'll stay in this enclosure, known as a boma, for about two weeks to prevent them from harming Lady or trying to escape back to Kafui as they acclimatize to their new environment. For Dr. Ian Parsons, the translocation so far is a success. Yeah, the lions have arrived. They, they're here now and um, flying peacefully, waking up slowly, surfacing from the anesthetic. And uh, we hope that that'll continue. It'll take about another half an hour to an hour for them to be fully awake. And uh, all being well, they'll have an uneventful recovery. The team wait out the last hours at a distance to make sure that the males wake up without complications. The lions seem healthy and unharmed by the journey. But through the night, painful yelps resound from the enclosure. Craig sets out at first light to assess the situation. The lions are challenging the electric fence. The males are agitated, with grazes from their assaults at the fence, but otherwise unharmed. As hoped, they seem to be keeping each other calm. 
but their cries have alerted more than just Craig. They can smell her before they can see her. Lady Lua. For the first time in over five years, she's heard the cries of her own kind, and she's come to investigate. Experience tells the males to be on the defensive. Lady is uncertain of the newcomers. She marks around the enclosure to assert herself. But the tension is short-lived. Over the next four days, the lions settle. Lady stays near them day and night, leaving only to hunt. Aggression seems to turn to curiosity. Fear to security. They are beginning to accept each other. Everything seems to be going perfectly according to plan. Until on the fifth day, Herbert and his crew make a shocking discovery. When they arrive at the enclosure, the lions are nowhere to be seen. Sir Timur, just have a look here. Herbert's tracker, Jacob Tembo, discovers something far more disturbing. There's a hole in the fence. The guys must have gotten out there. The boys are out. Let's go. Let's go. Let's get out of here and let's have a look. Let's, let's just go around and see whether we can maybe telemetry them or find them. The implications are devastating. If the lions have headed north towards Angola and the collar is out of range, this could be the end of yet another translocation. But it's not. Only a few hundred meters from the enclosure, the team find Lady and the lions lying calmly, watching each other. Lady begins to roll. But this time, it's not for Herbert. It's for her first real mates in a lifetime of loneliness. Whether the males will accept Lady Lua, mate with her, and form a new pride. Whether Lady will raise cubs of a new generation of lions in Lua. Only time will tell.
But for now at least, her call will not go unanswered. She is no longer the last lioness.